we go. All right. Our participant room is growing. This is fantastic. This is a really important, important webinar today for career services. Almost the top of the hour. Let's see. Yeah, we got about 15 seconds. So we'll uh, uh, see our participant numbers. We're, they're still popping in, so that's good. Hopefully there'll be a few more. And we always get an audience on um, our live stream. Of course, if you're in your live stream, please be aware that we are not monitoring the chat that's attached to the live stream. We are not that, we're not that good. We're good, we're not that good. Um, you'll actually have to log into uh, the Zoom webinar in order to interact with our speaker in terms of the chat function or the Q&A. But if you're watching the live stream, you will be able to participate in the session using our fantastic mentee. So um, again, Welcome to another Career Services webinar. Today's topic is preparing for work, get into the yes pile, resumes, cover letters, and references, references that sell you. I'm Dr. Deirdre Pickerel. I'm the Dean of Student Success for Yorkville University and Toronto Film School. And I'm thrilled to be joined by um, some key members of our team all involved in Career Services. We have Alexi, who's here and um, operates out of our Ontario campus. Natalia is here somewhere. I can't see your video, Natalia. I know you're there. Um, and Natalia's primary role is at Toronto Film School. And of course, we have Linda, who is our speaker today and who is out here with me in beautiful British Columbia. But of course, all career advisors uh, support all students across all programs, all brands. So if you need us, you just we're just literally a phone call away. Um, my role is just exactly this. I'm introducing the team and then I am leaving uh, them in your, or you in their very capable hands. So Linda, have a fantastic session. I know this will be great. Natalia, thanks for being our tech support. Have a great uh, session and then a great rest of your day, everybody. And you will see me again next time. I'm gonna exit stage left and turn it over to you, Linda. Hey, thanks so much, Deirdre, and thanks so much, Natalia, for stepping in. Um, I want to welcome everybody and let you know this is actually a really big topic. I've got a lot to pack into the next hour, and it's a very important topic. Uh, Natalia is going to be advancing our slides. So, Natalia, can you advance to the next one, please? Thank you. Uh, by the way, uh, if you have tuned into our webinars in the past, you'll know that we use the engagement software called Menti. Uh, the website menti.com is listed at the top of your screen, and you can use any device uh, to actually get onto that website. And there is a code that's listed, which will bring you straight to this particular webinar so that when I ask you questions throughout, you can answer directly and we will see all of your answers tabulated live. Uh, so that's actually really fun. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I've been doing this work for a long time. It's about 13 years now. And during that time, I have advised around a thousand clients in career transition. Uh, most of that has been in the nonprofit sector. However, before joining Yorkville last September, I did do some contract work in the post-secondary environment. As you can see from the various bullet points on the slide, I'm certified to administer and interpret a number of career assessments. And I am also a certified career development practitioner. Plus I hold a master's in adult education. Another interesting detail about my background is that I used to be an entrepreneur for about 12 years. And uh, as a result of having done that kind of work, I've also worked as a business advisor with a few hundred entrepreneurs at the startup stage. Next slide, please. How hard it can be to find work in this very competitive labor market. And if you're getting close to graduation, I know how much this means to you. I have certainly been there myself. And it's really hard to write about yourself. It's hard to guess what employers want to see when they read through resumes and cover letters. And it boils down to understanding the only question that employers have on their minds, which is, how can you be of value to me? And if you read job postings, and if you listen closely to what employers are saying when you meet with them, they'll give you clues about this. And oftentimes, they'll be quite explicit about it. So imagine for a moment what it would feel like if you read through your own cover letter and your resume once you finished them and you literally blushed to see how good you sound. 
I want you to also imagine how confident you would feel if you were to read the job description over and over again and see the employer's same words mirrored in your materials. These are indicators of fit. And I just want you to know that you are totally capable of reaching this level and particularly if you get help from us here at Career Services. I am about to share with you some strategies and some techniques that you can use in developing your resume and your cover letter that will help employers to see the possibility of fit when they read over your application. And this is what needs to happen for you to start getting invited for interviews. If you haven't been invited for interviews yet, this can be a game changer for you in your job search. Next slide, please. So here's the first question I have for you on Menti. Uh, log in if you haven't already done so. I'm curious to know how many of you have a resume that's ready to show employers now? Either yes, no, or maybe you're not sure. Okay, we have one no so far. We have a yes. We've got a few more yeses coming in and a few more no's. <laughs> Not surprising to see. I'll just give you another minute or so. Maybe some of you aren't really sure. Maybe you have a resume but you're not sure that it's the right one to start uh, getting it out there. Okay, so it looks like we're about evenly split. Um, next slide, please, Natalia. So I recently came across an interesting article. It said that recruiters care more about cover letters now than before the pandemic. And this was from a survey of 334 hiring managers where half of the respondents said, this is now more important to them. And I'll be showing you in the webinar about what goes into writing a great cover letter. And just in case you weren't aware of the importance of a laser targeted high quality resume, this quote puts it in perspective for you. Employers spend an average of five to seven seconds the first time they look at your resume. So think about that for a moment. On average, employers get around 250 applicants when they apply for a job and likely even more during times of high unemployment like now. So what that means is that you have about six seconds to make it into one of three piles, the yes pile, the no pile, or the maybe pile. And I am going to show you how to maximize your chances of making it into the yes pile. Next slide, please. So this quote is from an international recruiter. And just in case you weren't aware of the purpose of reference checks or just how important they are, she says, references can help a hiring manager who is teetering between two candidates, affirm a gut feeling or possibly provide insight into a question mark. Next slide, please. So as you can see, I'm going to pack a lot into this session. First, I'll review the three most common resume styles and I'll show you a checklist for each one so that you can get an idea of which would be the best choice for you. I'm gonna be focusing slightly more on the chronological style. And if one of the other two styles is a better option for you, I recommend that you also watch my other webinar called Writing a Resume When You Lack Experience, which is available in a pre-recorded version on our Yorkville YouTube channel. We'll also examine some of the key steps in developing targeted resumes and cover letters, plus how to manage yourself with respect to applicant tracking systems, and I'll tell you what those are, and reference requests. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a quote by Richie Norton, which I think is very relevant to our topic. He says, when it comes to getting a job or a client, congruent value is aligning the employer's need with your value add. In other words, there must be a match between what employers want and what you offer. That's congruency. And this needs to be your focus at every step of your job search, not just your resume and your cover letter. Next slide, please. Okay, so one resume style is called a functional resume. It's also known as a skills-based resume. And this is the most common style for new grads and also career changers. So as you can imagine, being a post-secondary institution, we work with a lot of students on functional resumes. 
Most people know about the chronological resume, which focuses on your work history. And although some of the sections in the functional resume are similar to the chronological style, the difference between them is that this one focuses on your relevant skills as opposed to your work experience. But you have to keep in mind that the skills that you decide to feature on this resume must be ones that the employer is actually looking for. That's what we mean by relevant skills. And again, that's what we mean by targeted resume. So for example, it might be great that you have excellent computer skills, but if you're going for a counseling job, that's not going to get an employer's attention. Instead, they'd wanna see that you're skilled at building relationships, that you have empathy, that you're a good listener and things like that. So it's not that you don't include your work history in this functional style resume, you do, but the work history section in this resume style consists of a simple listing of your uh, work history, um, including your positions held, the employers you worked for, and uh, your employment dates, but without any of the detail. So I'm gonna go through the criteria that make this style a good choice in the second column on the slide. This is a good choice if you have little to no experience in your field. Maybe you have work experience, but not in this career. Um, although maybe you lack experience, you have the skills required to do the job and you've used those skills in other areas of your life. And perhaps you have some gaps in your work history or you've changed jobs frequently, either of which can be a red flag to employers and you wanna downplay that. If this format seems like the best fit for you, you can learn more by watching the recording of the webinar I referred to earlier called Writing a Resume When You Lack Experience available on our YouTube channel. Next slide, please. The next style is called a combination resume. It's also known as a hybrid resume. And this is probably the least common style. And as the name suggests, it's a combination of the chronological and functional styles. Like the functional resume, um, the focus is on relevant skills, but the difference is that these are featured under each of your previous jobs, as opposed to being described at a detailed level within its own section called skills. This style includes a fully developed work history section, as opposed to a mere listing of your previous jobs as per the functional style. And then within each job listing, you would emphasize the skills you use that are relevant to the job that you're going for instead of the duties of each job. So I'm gonna go through the checklist in the center. This would be a good style for you if you're in the early stages of your career with anywhere from one to three years of relevant experience, which is considered minimal for most jobs. And maybe you've just worked for a few employers and yet you have a solid track record or perhaps you've graduated or are nearing graduation, but you haven't had many jobs, period. And this works if you're changing careers or even if you're changing industries. So for example, I switched from the nonprofit sector to the post-secondary sector, and it turns out that they're totally different worlds. Um, and so I ended up using a combination style uh, resume when I was job searching, and it worked really well for me. The style works well if you have no gaps in your work history. Because you'd be featuring your jobs in reverse chronological order and providing a detailed description of each one of them, if you have gaps, then these would be more noticeable in a combination style resume. So if you have gaps, you may want to choose a functional style. Again, for more on this, you can watch my other uh, resume webinar. Next slide, please. The last style is the one that most people are familiar with, and that's the chronological style. This style has the usual headings like objective, profile, education, and work experience, and it might include some other optional headings like volunteer work or hobbies. And the focus of this style is on work experience, where each of your jobs, your current job if you have one, and also your previous jobs, are listed in reverse chronological order, starting with your most recent job and working backwards in time to show past jobs. So again, the column in the center shows when this is an appropriate choice for you. And here are some situations where this one's a fit. When you have many years of experience in a particular career that you're targeting now, especially when you can show progression, 
If you've worked in one specific industry, but for different employers, in other words, there's a pattern that an employer can make sense of uh, where your work history is consistent with little to no gaps. So based on these three checklists that I've gone through with you, hopefully you now have an idea of which resume style to use for your situation. Next slide, please. So on that note, I'm curious, uh, what do you think? Which resume style fits your situation at this point in time? Functional, combination, chronological, or maybe you don't know. Okay, wow, we're pretty evenly split here. <laughs> okay, so far we see that combination is winning. I'll just give you a moment in case you haven't had a chance to answer yet. Okay, so we've got a tile between, tie between combination and chronological. Okay. Okay, the point is that I'm hoping that the checklist gave you enough information to be able to make that decision because it's a very important one. Next slide, please. So this is a screenshot of a resume of someone who was looking to progress her career in the pharmaceutical industry. As you can see, it has the usual sections. It has an objective statement. Um, if you can read it, you can see how it's worded in a way that sells her. It has a profile section, and that summarizes all the key relevant points she offers. This section, by the way, is very important because often this is what employers read during those first five seconds. And so I'm gonna be showing you what to include in this section. Then this is followed by her professional experience. As you can see, she's featured her industry experience since 2002. And if you look closely at each job, you'll see that she's listed several accomplishments for each one. And a little bit later, we'll look at why this is a good idea. And then the last section is formal education and special training, where she lists what she's completed that's relevant in her industry. So Michelle's resume tells a story. It shows progression, it shows commitment, there's lots of passion, and it also shows ambition. And it's laser targeted to her goal of rising to a management role in the pharmaceutical industry. By the way, I want you to know this is a real person and she did end up getting the job. So notice how this resume packs a lot of information into two pages. And on that note, there's often confusion about how long a resume should be. And although there are different opinions about this, the most common expectation among employers and recruiters is that a resume should be no longer than two pages. Of course, one exception to this is people who are applying for positions in say, um, higher education or maybe the medical field, uh, academia or um, scientific positions. People in those kind of situations can create a CV that's a curriculum vitae and there's no page limit for CVs. Next slide, please. Okay, so in the next few slides, we'll take a look at all the different sections that can be included in a resume. As you can see from the table, for each section I've indicated whether you should include it or whether it's optional, depending on things like what employers prefer to see, whether you have enough space for it on the two pages, and whether it adds anything relevant that helps to sell you. So think about every line on your resume as valuable real estate, meaning that there's no room for anything that doesn't sell you. Each page of your resume should include a header at the top, but don't actually format this using the header feature in Word. And this is because if you apply for any jobs posted on online uh, job boards, the computer algorithm, the applicant tracking system doesn't recognize information in headers. So here in the header, you'd use a font size larger than the body of your resume. Make sure to put your name on both pages, but on page one, feature your contact information, such as your email and your phone number in the city where you live. Of course, the employer needs to contact you if they wanna set up an interview, so that contact info has to be there. And then on page two, you would include your name and the page number. Links to your social media profiles can be included in your header if you have the space, but only if they relate to the position and if they showcase your relevant talents. 
So obviously LinkedIn is a good one to include here. If you have a website related to the career you're pursuing, which is often the case for many creatives, then you can include a link to it. Do not include social media icons if you're applying for jobs online because the screening software doesn't recognize these fancy graphics. All right, next is the resume objective. This is a short statement where in two or three lines, you summarize your career goal as it relates to the position you're applying for. And the biggest problem with most career objectives is that they are too generic, making them use, useless and therefore a waste of very valuable space. Um, it's interesting to note that 50% of employers apparently want to see an objective statement, whereas 50% do not. Uh, so if you decide to write one, carefully research the job and make sure that you're writing a very targeted objective that sells you, um, or else just leave it off your resume. And um, in a moment, I'm going to be showing you some samples of objective statements that actually sell you. Uh, next is the profile. That's also sometimes called highlights of qualifications or summary of qualifications. And this is a summary of your relevant background and skills targeted to the job. And it can include all of those items listed in the tips column on the slide. So uh, the profile section can be written using bullet points or you can do it in a short paragraph that's anywhere from three to five lines. And once again, a reminder that employers typically read this section first and they might end up doing their first screening by only reading this section. So it's really super important. And then there's the education. Include your post-secondary education. If you have other credentials and certifications, include them as well, but make sure to only include what's relevant to the job. You don't need to include your high school diploma because if you've completed a university degree, it's assumed that you finished high school. Next slide, please. Okay, next is skills. It's really important to research what skills employers are looking for and match their language with the ones that you can offer. In a chronological resume, these are usually featured as part of the profile section, and therefore they don't need their own heading, whereas in a functional or combination style resume, these would be more prominently featured in their own separate section. You should be showcasing a combination of your hard and soft skills. Hard skills are ones that are very specific to particular jobs, like using certain types of software, if your field is technical, or doing intake interviews if you're a counselor. Whereas soft skills are ones that transfer to any job. Those are also known as transferable skills. So some examples are communication skills, organization, adaptability, and so on. And then your work experience section. Under this section, the guideline is to feature only your last three jobs or the past 10 years, unless your experience prior to that is relevant. So only include content for positions that are relevant to the job. If you've chosen a functional format, this section will simply be a listing of your previous jobs. And if you're trying to avoid showing gaps in employment, you can include jobs that are not relevant, but you limit these to a listing of one or two lines so that you can show the chronology of your work history, but you don't include the detail in those jobs that aren't relevant to your job target. Other information included on many resumes includes industry awards and industry memberships, these can be important to include, again, if space is available, and if there's a link between this information and the position that you're applying for. Hobbies and volunteer work can be included if you have space, but remember that your resume is all about real estate. That's the way I want you to think about it, and selling yourself as the ideal candidate. If you don't have enough space where you can't link your hobbies or your volunteer work to the position, then it's better to leave these out. Now, if you've done volunteer work and some of it is relevant, whereas other positions are not, then um, it's better to only feature the relevant positions. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so as promised, here are a few examples of objective statements. These are samples of students targeting um, an energy manager position and a counseling practicum placement. The first column shows the typical way that people write objective statements. And we often see this at career services when we review resumes. So let's take a look at the first one, a position as manager climate action for and, and energy for Fortis BC. Um, so you can see that the way that this is written is pretty much just stating the obvious. The place to mention something like this is in the first paragraph of your cover letter. Because remember what I said earlier about thinking about every line on a resume as real estate. This objective statement is so general that it's essentially a waste of space. Now let's have a look at the second column. Same job, different way of writing the objective statement. To use my initiative, research, problem solving, and team building skills to develop solutions to climate change issues and educate North Americans in how to be environmentally responsible. So this person refers to his relevant skills and also the heartfelt way in which he wants to use them. This is a powerful statement that sells him instead of just stating the obvious. And this appears right at the top of his resume, so it grabs the employer's attention right away. And then the second one on the slide is another example of this contrast. Next slide, please. The next section where I wanna show you some samples is the profile section. Again, sometimes this is labeled as summary of qualifications or highlights of qualifications. And as I mentioned earlier, most employers read this section first and their first screening might include only reading this section. So it's very critical. Remember again that they spend only five seconds the first time they look at your resume. So how you write this can make or break your chances to get them to read on. So what should you include here and how long should it be? There are two styles you can write this in, either bullet points or else a short paragraph. If you use bullet points, I suggest between five and seven. And if you're writing it in a short paragraph, then three to five lines should be about right. This section is a summary that's targeted to the job and it can include your number of years of relevant experience, your education and special training, a related accomplishment and your hard and soft skills. So again, I keep, just keep on saying this over and over again, that it must be laser targeted to the job. You should be customizing your resume for each job you apply to. So this doesn't necessarily mean that you need to develop a brand new resume for each job, but you may have different possible job targets and you should tailor each version of your resume to the specific job that you're applying for. And this is one section where you'll likely be adjusting it for each job. So in column one, we see an example of someone targeting a counseling position, and she has used the bullet points format. And the next one is an example using the short paragraph format. And this was a woman who changed careers from an IT consultant to a holistic nutritionist. That's a huge career change. And both of these people, by the way, were former clients of mine, and both of them got the job. Next slide, please. So what do you think? Which of the following resume sections is not considered optional? Awards or memberships, objective statement, profile, volunteering, or hobbies? Yay, you guys are on it. Profile absolutely is very important and should be included in your resume. Good on you. Okay, next slide, please. So when you're writing the content within each job in your work experience section, I highly recommend that instead of just listing your job duties, you think about how you stood out in each of those jobs and write about your accomplishments. And here's why. First of all, if you just write a list of your duties, this reads like a job description and it's really boring to read. Secondly, no two people doing the same job do it in the same way. And so it makes no sense for this part of your resume to look exactly the same as your colleagues. You wanna instead write about the unique ways you made a contribution. 
and these are called accomplishment statements. So you're probably wondering, how can you turn your duties into accomplishments? So there's a link to the article that you see. Um, there's a little graphic to this article at the top of the slide on the right hand side. We have this uh, fantastic article in our resume resources. So let me just summarize the key points for you. First, you need to know the difference between a duty and an accomplishment. A duty describes what you did and an accomplishment describes how well you did it. If you add some metrics, you give the employer some important context that would otherwise be missing. Next step, make a list. For each of your previous jobs or volunteer positions, ask yourself questions like, what did I do that was above and beyond my normal duties? How did I stand out? When and why have I been recognized for a job well done? So there's more probing questions like this included in this article. And if you don't have much experience, then you can use examples from any area of your life, actually. Uh, next point, paint the picture with numbers. Add as many facts and figures and numbers as you can. By quantifying your accomplishments, you really allow the hiring manager to picture the level of responsibility that you had. And then finally, you add the benefit. This is the punchline. Make sure to include what the results were. This demonstrates not only what you're capable of, it also shows the employer how they'll benefit from hiring you. And I'm gonna show you a, a couple of examples next. Next slide, please. So these examples are from my resume. In the left column, you see a very typical style of listing duties under each job. So let's take a look at the contrast between writing these as duties versus accomplishment statements. The first one reads, deliver dependable strengths job search program to cohorts of unemployed clients. So what does this tell you about me? Basically, it says that I completed this task with a specific audience, but what if I did a terrible job of it? What if none of the clients found work? So this might allow an employer to check off a detail on their checklist of qualifications, but other applicants might also have this on their resume and it may or may not make them curious to follow up and invite me to an interview. So instead I wrote it like this, upon delivery of dependable strengths through strategic partnership with Dress for Success, an immigrant client found work six weeks post-program in her profession of origin after nine years misemployed as a nanny since relocating to Canada. You know, I remember this client. It was an unbelievable result. Six weeks after she completed this job search program, she got, she got an accounting position, which moved her out of the survival job scenario that so many newcomers to Canada face. So just imagine now an employer would react to reading this compared to the job duty approach. Next slide, please. Here's an example of the first step to take when writing your resume. This is based on a real case study. This woman was changing careers. She had been a self-employed hairstylist for 11 years and she decided to pursue a lifelong dream of becoming a dog trainer. She completed a dog trainer certification, but she didn't have any relevant formal work experience to put on her resume. So this first step is the same for all job seekers, regardless of your situation and regardless of the style of resume that you choose. You need to first get very clear about what employers are looking for. So just how can she find out about that, about what employers are looking for? On the right-hand side of the slide, you see a job description that we found on the internet and the process she used was to go through it in detail and highlight in yellow all the requirements that match up with what she brings to the table. The highlighted words and terms are what she needs to mirror in her resume. This web page was just one of many that she looked at during her research stage. She used the same process of highlighting for all the pages that she looked at, and then she looked for the common themes, and that's what she focused on in her resume. 
And she got called in for an interview uh, for the first job she applied for, and they offered her the job on the spot. And this is somebody who was changing careers and had no relevant work experience. Next slide, please. The next question is, how can she articulate her relevant skills? So what I'm about to show you is uh, very similar to the process that this woman went through. These are screenshots from a document by a company called SkillScan. It takes you through various activities to help you to identify the skills that are strongest for you and that you most enjoy using. In other words, these are your motivated skills. And this document, by the way, is included in our resources, so you can have access to it. This assessment includes a list of 48 skills, and for each one, you give yourself a score for how well you do it, plus how much you enjoy it. And you end up with numerical scores for your motivated skills. And based on these ratings, you can prioritize from your strongest to your weakest skills. This can help you to identify what skills to feature if you're developing a functional or a combination resume. Plus, it helps you to know what to talk about in job interviews when they ask you questions about what your strengths and weaknesses are. Remember, though, that you will select the ones to focus on based on what's relevant to the job you're going after. I keep repeating that. Next slide, please. So why do you think listing accomplishments is better than job duties in your work experience section? What do you think? Might take a little bit of thought. We just talked about it. more interesting to the reader. It definitely is more interesting to the reader. What else do you think? Well, basically it helps you uh, to stand out in a way that distinguishes you from um, other people who might be applying for the job. Relevant experience, very good. More informative of your capabilities. These are great answers. Unique, absolutely. Okay, you're starting to, to get what I am trying to uh, put across here, which is great to see. Thanks everybody. All right, Natalia, next slide, please. Okay, so we're moving on now to applicant tracking systems. If you're applying for any jobs online, you need to know how applications get filtered because this can help you to write in a way that helps you to get screened in. Many employers use online application systems. These are called applicant tracking systems or ATSs to screen. These are algorithms that make candidate screening more efficient. Unfortunately, they also remove the human element. And common features of ATSs include requiring applicants to set up an account and a profile with um, your name and your contact info. Uh, you'll have to write in your work history, uh, enter your education. They wanna know what your skills are. Uh, you can usually upload a cover letter and a resume, and you might also have to input the information directly into their platform. And the point is to get your information into the ATS so that it can scan for keywords. Uh, there's a number of tips that you can see on this slide and I just want to explain the last point. It says don't rely on online applications. Did you know that it's estimated that 80% of jobs are never advertised? This is called the hidden job market. Most people don't know about this. And ATSs remove the human element. So a good rule of thumb is to spend no more than around 20% of your efforts on online job search and the other 80% to build and nurture your network to help you find work. And of course, we have a recorded webinar on this topic too, and you can find it on our YouTube channel. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to cover letters. Your resume 
is formal and it's unfriendly. Your cover letter explains why you're applying for the job and in it you use real world examples of your experience. It's a chance to show your personality and some excitement. It's a way of showing that you understand the job. Employers can easily detect how much effort you put into your cover letter, so make an effort. There are some important do's and don'ts to keep in mind. First, make sure to laser target your cover letter because generic cover letters make a bad impression and generic cover letters are unfortunately very common. And part of laser targeting is to focus on what the employer needs and show how you can meet these needs. Next, if you were referred by someone the employer knows, then mention this because it can increase your chances of getting interviewed. Put in the effort to find out the hiring manager's name and include it on your cover letter. Uh, you can try to find this out by searching the company website um, under the meet the team section, or you can look them up on LinkedIn, or you could even make a phone call to the company asking for the name of the person who will be reviewing resumes. I've done this before and it's a successful strategy. So although you might think this is a small detail, it shows effort and it's just one more way to make you stand out. You'll need to use the standard business letter format, which I will show you in a minute. And also please make sure to proofread it several times and you might even get someone else with excellent English to proofread it for you because having errors leaves a bad impression. Some employers um, will automatically screen you out just because you have errors in your resume or cover letter. So some things to avoid are don't skip the cover letter. It's very important in competitive times like these. It shouldn't go over one page. And lastly, uh, don't just copy and paste from your resume because that shows a lack of effort and it also doesn't show your personality. Next slide, please. So here's a breakdown of what should be included in the content. A cover letter should be no more than three or four paragraphs. Ideally, you wanna use the same header at the top of the page that you use for your resume, including your name and your contact info. Um, when you do this, it gives a consistent professional look to your application. It's kind of like personal branding. In your first paragraph, include the name of the position you're applying for and explain why you're excited about the role. The second paragraph should feature your relevant background. And the overall theme of that paragraph should be, here's what you need and here's what I offer that you need. This can include uh, details like a key accomplishment and should also include your relevant skills. Make sure to use keywords to help you get screened in. Plus, you can help the employer understand your resume by including the names of your recently held positions where you use these skills and where you achieve these accomplishments. And then the third paragraph is the closing. Here you can provide one last statement summarizing your fit for the position and why you're uniquely qualified and make sure to ask for the sale. In other words, mention your availability for an interview and say that you're looking forward to hearing about next steps in the process. And I'll show you a template for this. Next slide, please. So here's what the standard business letter format looks like. It's a template that explains what should be featured in each section. And it also shows the proper formatting. Again, this is a resource that you can get from us at Career Services. So if you're interested, just send me an email and I'll email it back to you. Next slide, please. So this is an example of an excellent cover letter. It's a real one. Everything that I'm showing you today is from real world examples. This is someone applying for an assistant visual manager position at a women's boutique. It follows the format that I showed you in the template from the last slide. She has lots of relevant experience, which is beautifully showcased here. Um, plus uh, it shows a lot of passion and enthusiasm. And once again, this, example is included in our resources, so feel free to request it. If there's any MACP students in the audience, then there are some additional specific suggestions for your cover letters uh, for your practicum. And I have a specific example of an MACP cover letter that I can share as well. Next slide, please. 
So here's a test for you. Which of the following statements about cover letters is false? Um, it is to show your personality and enthusiasm. You should target it to each job. You should copy and paste from your resume, uh, focus on what the employer needs or mention who referred you if applicable. Which one of these is false? Okay, it's a test to see how much you're paying attention. Wow, everybody got it. You're absolutely right. You should not be copying and pasting from your resume. Well done. Next slide, please. Now we're going to talk about references. When employers ask for these, what they want is names and contact information of people. They don't want reference letters. Letters belong in your portfolio. Employers want to speak with people to ask probing questions about you and your work. A call to the HR department is not a reference, unless, of course, someone in HR worked closely with you. Employers conduct reference checks to verify that what you said in the interview was true. They want to get an outsider's perspective on your performance because past performance is the best predictor of future performance. And they also want to know what you were like to work with because fit is near the top of their list. So here's what you need to do. Contact your references to let them know that your job searching and what kind of work you're looking for. And you need to request permission to use their name. You'll need to make a reference list for uh, employers and you should give your references a heads up after an interview that you had that went well. It should never come as a surprise for your references to receive a phone call. I sometimes received unexpected calls for reference checks and because I didn't have a chance to prepare, those references were not very strong. And I have sometimes said no when people have asked me to be a reference because in those cases, I honestly didn't feel I could find positive things to say about the person. This is why it's so important to request permission. Your references will wanna know more about the job you've interviewed for, so you can email the posting and you can even request what you would like them to emphasize if they're called. You should provide at least three references and it's okay if they're from another country. The employer's part is to request the references from you and don't offer them until they ask. When they do, it's usually a sign that they're considering hiring you. Then the employer proceeds to contact your references, usually by phone. They typically have a set of prepared questions. If an employer is having difficulty deciding between a few good candidates, then reference checks can help them decide. Also, an employer might have particular instincts about you from the interview, and this could be positive, but they might also have doubts. And when this happens, they might ask more probing questions so that they can learn what they need to about you in order to decide. Next slide, please. So who should you ask to be references for you? References don't have to be former supervisors. They should ideally be someone who knows your work. It can be your manager or your senior leader of your department, but it could also be your colleagues. They should be people who support you and also very important people who can be easily reached. In some cases, you may not be able to or you may not feel comfortable to use your previous manager. You know what? Working relationships are like any relationship in life. Some are positive and others are not. It happens. And in these cases, you should be able to explain to the employer why you don't want to give that person as a reference. So if it's true, you can say that you lost contact with this person or that other people in the office know your work better. And in a situation like this, you can use former colleagues, you can use instructors from your program of study, uh, you can use a manager in a place where you volunteered or even former clients or customers. The bottom line is to create a list so that you can control who they contact. Next slide, please. So here's an example of how you can format a reference list document. You should list at three, you should list at least three references and you can add one or two more just in case any of them are not immediately available when the employer calls. And that happens all the time, by the way. Make sure to include for each person their name, their relationship to you, the name of the organization where they work, their email address, and their phone number. Next slide, please. 
So who can you ask to be a reference for you? Check off all of the ones that are true. Uh, in, an instructor, a volunteer program director, former manager, close friend, co-worker, client, or customer, a family member. Check off all that uh, you can uh, ask to be your reference. Co-worker so far, yeah, co-worker would be fine. What else do you think? Current or former manager, that's a good choice as well. Yeah, a manager of a volunteer agency where you worked. Okay, so this is good because there's two on there that I would not like to see you use as references and those are a close friend or a family member because obviously it would be very difficult for them to provide an unbiased and objective answer. Okay, next slide, please. So one final announcement I wanna share with you is that Career Services created some very thorough documents and a tool, we have templates to help you create a strong resume, a resume that really sells you. And our process really, really works. At the end of this session, in other words, the next slide, I'm gonna display our email addresses where you can write to us to request the resources from this webinar um, so that you can start getting informed about these kind of guidelines and get started on your own. And the documents that I can email to you include an instruction booklet, uh, some sample resumes in each of these three styles that I talked about, We've got resume templates for each of these styles and also a skills activity. Um, and that's really helpful if you're gonna be creating a functional or a combination style resume. Next slide, please. And I think this quote is very appropriate to conclude. Your value will not be what you know, it will be what you share. Because being selective and strategic about what you share is gonna give you a shot at getting interviewed. And once you land a job, there's plenty of opportunity to share the rest of your valuable knowledge. And then the final slide, please, Natalia. Okay, so uh, just making sure that you know that there are resources I've referred to, we can send them to you, you just need to email us. We also can provide one-on-one -on -one coaching to help you with this. All you need to do is shoot us an email at careerservices at yorkvilleu.ca or careerservices at torontofilmschool.ca. Okay, so that's all I have for you today. Um, Natalia, can you please stop screen sharing? And uh, we are ready to take your questions now. Okay. okay. Oh, somebody said it only let us choose one option. I think it was uh, regarding one of the last questions. Okay, my apologies. If, if I, I, yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> Thanks for the for the tip. I'll look out for that next time. Um, you must have some questions about resumes. It's a big, huge topic, and um, it can be daunting task actually to create a targeted resume. Uh, what we see a lot in career services is, you know, this the typical uh, standard classic university student resume, which basically is always what we see pretty much a chronological style. And it includes things like your retail and restaurant experience um, and maybe something else, which are the very typical. I had exactly those kind of jobs when I was a university student and that's not gonna get you your first professional job. So a functional resume would be um, the, uh, the choice, the way to go. So how to answer the question, what is your five year plan if you are interviewing for an admin assistant position? You know, that's such a, a personal choice about what you answer for that. Um, so, so maybe I can talk about more specifically what might raise a red flag for employers. Uh, they might be concerned if you start talking about plans that indicated that you weren't really interested in an admin assistant position. If, in fact, in reality, the admin assistant position was just a way into the organization and a stepping stone for you, if, if you made it sound like that's clearly and obviously what, what your strategy is, that would be a big red flag to employers. Um, but, you know, typical things that people respond with is just to talk about growing in their career. 
um, progressing in the field um, and learning and all of these sorts of things are, are very common types of very acceptable answers. Um, I know when I've had that answer in the past, um, what's true for me and what I've said is that um, I don't have a very specific goal for five years from now. The most important thing to me is that I gain fulfillment from my job and that I'm always learning and growing. We have another question, Linda, uh, in Q&A. Okay. Uh, thank you for all the information. What if the potential employer is asking for a cover page that is longer than one page? I'm assuming cover letter um, that is longer than one page. My current employer had asked for a five-page resume. Oh, your current employer had asked applicants for a five-page resume. You know something? Um, that is a great question. It's a great example of how important it is to um, actually pay attention to what employers are looking for and provide them with that. If that employer is looking for a five-page resume, then provide a five-page resume. <laughs> but, but when you are creating each one of those five pages, make sure that you are still targeting it to uh, the types of skills and experience and education and so on that they're looking for. Yeah, and keep, uh, um, you know, keep an eye on, on the job posting. For example, when I was applying for post-secondary education, uh, some universities have very, very specific instructions on how you need to name your file. So it's the first letter of your first name and then your last name and then dash and then like resume. So it's very, very specific and, and you know, some specific instructions about the cover letter as well. So always read it, you know, very carefully and, and make sure your documents um, are, exact, uh, are exactly the, uh, that they're expecting from you. Exactly. Well. Very good point. Just show that you can read instructions and follow them. <laughs> yeah. Have we got any other questions? Yeah. Not for now. Yeah. Natalia, and Alexi, do you, Natalia and Alexi, do you have any other tips to add that I didn't cover today? Anything that you've come across? Mm -hmm. Or do you think I covered it? <laughs> you you were very thorough, and it's a lot of really useful information, yeah. especially the fact of tailoring your resume to those jobs. If you want the advanced version of how to make a good resume, look at the job posting, see the um, the re job requirements, and go almost point for point to make sure to say that you have something that's relevant to that employer. If they chose it to be important enough to put on the job posting, then they're going to be looking for those as well. So make it easy for them, go point for point. Exactly. Also, a, a good tip would be to avoid any acronyms, uh, short, uh, short forms for it, because even though your industry might know those terms completely, you might not be hired by a person of that industry. You might be hired by the HR manager who may not be as relevant as knowledgeable about those terms as well. So on a resume, it's usually good to avoid taking shortcuts to actually spell it out if it's something that's not commonly known. Yeah, that's excellent advice, Alexi. And, and I particularly appreciate how you kept saying, make it easy for the employer, because that's exactly what your task is. Uh, what we see a lot is people who create a resume and they actually expect the employer to study it in a detailed way and take time to do that. And they expect the employer to just look for and find the relevance without putting the effort in to make that obvious. And the employer is not going to do that. Can you imagine looking at 250 or 300 resumes? There is simply not the time. And in fact, it's very frustrating to employers to receive resumes that aren't targeted. And they'll often just move on really quickly. Exactly, Alexi. And, and end up, as I have, when I've looked at resumes like that, thinking, why did you even send me a resume? <laughs> yes. Okay. So and it's all I think one, one more thing, uh, I don't remember if you mentioned that, uh, but I think it's quite important to mention that because I see it on resumes all the time, mm -hmm. make sure your references are not part of your resume. Exactly. So when you send it out, uh, and you can imagine, maybe you're applying for 50 different jobs. So those phone numbers and emails of those people who, who provide you references mm -hmm. are going to be walking around the internet. So you don't want to yeah, you don't want them you know, to call those random people. So make sure it's not on your resume. It's not a part of it. Um, because if they ask you for it, you, you have to provide it on a separate piece of paper. And uh, usually it's after uh, you already had an interview or sometimes for uh, higher level positions, um, 
for example, like I said, when I was applying for a university, one of the universities actually required me to bring my references to an interview, but they told me that uh, during our phone conversation. But I still, it wasn't a part of the resume. It was a separate piece of paper that I had to bring in. Yeah, excellent point. Very true. Yeah. We have two more minutes. I know one of the frequent questions that we get is, um, can you still write a resume if you've never worked before? Right. Uh, do we want to share a little bit of insight on in what you can talk about if employment is, if you're new to employment? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, you had a life before you went to school. Um, you had different roles in your life. Maybe you were involved in sports or you did babysitting, or maybe you had particular hobbies, uh, maybe you volunteered. And all of these different areas of your life were uh, uh, contexts in which you had a chance to use your skills and to accomplish different things. And uh, if you use a skills-based resume, then there is plenty of opportunity to tell these stories in, under each of the relevant skills sections in your functional resume. and. We guide and coach people to do that all the time. And it's actually really um, heartwarming and impressive to see the kinds of stories that people feature. And um, I can remember one uh, situation where I worked with a client who, or a student who was changing careers to become a counselor. And he used to have a very um, established career as a businessman in the engineering sector. And so his first resume was all about that and had nothing to do with counseling. And the next version of his resume had all these stories of where he supported friends who were in need and really struggling. And um, I'm telling you, it brought tears to my eyes because it was so touching because I could see the counselor in him. And he ended up um, getting an interview. He ended up getting a practicum placement. And interestingly enough, during his job interview, the interviewers they were quite intrigued by these stories and they started asking for more details about these stories. So don't underestimate the value of those stories. They're incredibly relevant to uh, the kind of work that you're seeking. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. And also something I found with students is they discount their assignments as relevant experience. While you're in school going through these projects, the point of uh, of faculty of giving you these assignments mm -hmm. is to develop your skills, but it also shows that you have those skills as well. So you could definitely pull on major projects and uh, group assignments to show the skills that it required to do that successfully as well. So the time you are in school, take inventory of that, of the things you've accomplished, because that can go a long way towards that. Totally, if you have a capstone project, if you've done group projects, which I know you have, these are all relevant. So I think between the three of us, we've pretty much covered it all. Thank you, Natalia and Alexi, for adding to uh, what I talked about today. I think we're pretty much out of time. So again, please shoot us an email for uh, questions and resources at careerservices at yorkfilmview.ca or careerservices at torontofilmschool.ca. And please join us two weeks from now. Which one of you is up two weeks from now? Alexi, Alexi what's your topic? It is actually targeting for the uh, hidden job market. Okay, right. so that's what I referred to and he's gonna tell you all about it. All right, so same time, same place, two weeks from now, we'll see you then, tell your friends. <laughs> Thanks Bye, for everyone. tuning in.